Congress is directing the Pentagon to build an interim Homeland Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Defense Interceptor by 2026, a weapon that's not in the Missile Defense Agency's current plans to counter threats from North Korea and Iran. I recently spoke with Defense News Ground combat reporter Jen Judson about the plan. Jen, welcome. Let's start. What are the current holes right now in missile defense in the homeland? Well, I mean, right now we're mostly concerned about um, rogue threats, North, uh, North Korea and Iran. Um, and so we are designing our missile defense systems against those. Um, so we have, I mean, we obviously don't have fully capable interceptors that could go out against uh, an interceptor that has decoys or countermeasures. Uh, and so we do need an interceptor that has a reliability to go after uh, an, an a ballistic missile of that with the with those qualities with those capabilities. Um, so a redesigned kill vehicle do that. A next generation interceptor could do that. But in the meantime, we could also use the terminal high altitude area defense system positioned in strategic places in the Pacific. Um, we could use uh, Aegis, and that's exactly what the Missile Defense Agency is proposing uh, to do: is to fill in sort of an underlay um, that would. Uh, bolster the uh, GMD system that is in the homeland for homeland uh, ballistic missile defense. For having an interim interceptor, it would have to be developed in a few years and then a replacement for that, just what, two years after that? Yeah, so uh, Congress actually wants to see an interim interceptor uh, that made it into some language in, in the current National Defense Authorization Act. Uh, they want, they're, they're going to give Missile Defense Agency 30 days uh, to come up with a plan to field an interim interceptor. Um, you know, however, the goal is to get the NGI uh, fielded hopefully by 2028, if no later than 2030. Um, the timeline, it's really, really vital that, uh, that the Missile Defense Agency move quickly on this and not screw this up like RKV. Um, I think Congress put this language in, um, as a way to maybe promote that um, because they also included a waiver uh, in this language that would get the Missile Defense Agency out of having to do an interim interceptor. Um, that would cost quite a bit of money and really only fill things in two, two years before the NGI. Um, so they would have to show that it's not technically feasible. Um, I mean, just recently the RKV was, was shown to be not technically feasible. Um, and also they would need to say that the capability isn't uh, in national security interests. Um, and if an interim system can't be fielded, be, you know, at least two years before NGI can be fielded. So there is a way out the door here. And I do imagine the Missile Defense Agency will take that way out. The Navy has had its own success recently where it shot down an intercontinental ballistic missile in outer space from a ship that was over by Hawaii. Uh, does it have any impact in this kind of interim uh, interceptor? Um, so not in an interim interceptor, but it does impact what the Missile Defense Agency uh, is thinking about doing and designing an underlay capability to help bolster their uh, ground-based mid course defense system. So the idea is to use, you know, THAAD systems and Aegis systems, but the, the test of the SM3 Block 2A would be a part of that underlay. Um, and the fact that it was successful um, will likely gear the Missile Defense Agency towards um, incorporating that capability uh, into an under an underlay architecture for Homeland Missile Defense. The missile that was used in the Navy test was the SM3 Block 2A. Can you tell us a little bit about that missile? Yeah, that, that's an important missile. It's it's highly capable. Um, it's sort of it's next gen uh, regional um, missile defense um, for Aegis systems. Uh, it did have some struggles in tests um, in the past, but it's had. Um, a successful test since then, and this was a, a very important test um, and that was successful. Um, and, and because it was successful, the Missile Defense Agency will likely incorporate that into an underlay architecture um, if they were to go that route. Um, so that, that could play a very important part in an underlay capability. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. And now for this week's headlines. The B-1B Lancer has successfully fired a stealthy cruise missile from an external pylon for the first time, adding another capability to its arsenal and potentially paving the way for the bomber to launch hypersonic missiles in the future. During a December demonstration in New Mexico, the B-1 launched an inert Joint Air-to-Surface Standoff Missile, or JASM, from the external pylon. 
the test proves the B-1B can be configured to carry weapons externally, opening the door for new weapon configurations for the aircraft, including the potential ability to launch hypersonic missiles when they become available. General Tim Ray, who leads Air Force Global Strike Command, said that arming a limited number of the bombers with weapons externally would provide more options for commanders while putting fewer aircraft and crew at risk. Prototypes competing to be the Army's new light tank for infantry are being tested by the All-Americans themselves. Soldiers of the 82nd Airborne Division at Fort Bragg are testing the vehicles and helping the Pentagon make a decision. The assessment of two different Mobile Protected Firepower or MPF prototypes for infantry will run between January and June. BAE Systems and General Dynamics Land Systems were chosen in December 2018 to each build 12 prototypes of the Army's future MPF vehicle. A winner is expected to be chosen near the end of fiscal year 2022. Also in Land Warfare News, Oshkosh Defense is hoping to up its artificial intelligence game with a recent acquisition. Oshkosh Defense, which makes the Joint Light Tactical Vehicle, or JLTV, announced it has agreed to buy engineering company Pratt Miller, which brings with it artificial intelligence, autonomy, and robotics expertise. Oshkosh said in a December news release that it has entered into a definitive agreement to acquire Pratt Miller in a cash-free, debt-free purchase price of $115 million. The Michigan-based Pratt Miller will keep its name, team, facilities, and branding, according to the announcement. The acquisition also could give Oshkosh more leverage in competitions like the GLTV recompete effort and the optionally manned fighting vehicle program to replace the Bradley Infantry Fighting Vehicle. And now to China. A paper published by the Chicago-based Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists has estimated that China has 350 nuclear warheads. That's significantly more than estimated by the U.S. Defense Department. These weapons include hypersonic missiles, intercontinental ballistic missiles, and their submarine launched equivalents. The Pentagon estimated the number to be closer to 200 in its 2020 report on China's military. The think tank's report also said an estimated 272 of the 350 warheads in the People's Liberation Army are operational. This is your Defense News Minute. I'm Daniel Wolfolk.